Florida Crossroads is produced with support from the Florida Department of Education. In the last half of the 18th century, at a time when the peninsula known as La Florida was as mysterious and unknown as the deepest Amazon is today, a man who was an odd blend of sensitive artist and fearless explorer blazed a trail down into its darkest heart. His trail became Bartram's Travels, and with the power of his pen, he opened the gateway to a mysterious place rich with resource and opportunity. Hello, I'm Beth Switzer. In the 1700s, William Bartram became the first American naturalist to explore the wilderness that was to become the state of Florida. The record of what he found here continues to move people today, helping us piece together the record of our unique environment. We invite you to come along with us in search of Xanadu and the same secrets that once fascinated William Bartram so long ago. Rising out of a swampy and mysterious jungle, the river we know today as the St. John's meandered for 300 miles along Florida's east coast. Flowing from south to north, the river seemed more like a chunk of South America than part of his own continent. Although others regarded it as frightfully Gothic, Billy Bartram saw another face of the St. John's. He described it as grand and enchanting. Like the odd and whimsical St. John's, naturalist Billy Bartram followed his own rhythms too, capturing his abiding love for Florida in his words and drawings. The rich imagery in his writings influenced poets and naturalists for years to come, from Wadsworth and Thoreau to Audubon and Muir. After reading Billy's description of Florida's springs, the romantic poet Coleridge wrote of the mystical Xanadu where Alf the sacred river ran, through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. But that was over 220 years ago, long before Florida became one of the fastest growing states in the country, falling into a Faustian swoon with the glitz of man-made contrivances. Could there be anything left of the St. John's Billy Bartram first encountered? Could anyone still find a true sense of wildness and discovery in this fast lane, Florida? One man wants to find out. He's Bill Belleville, a veteran environmental writer who's nurtured his own long-standing relationship with the natural Florida. As a kid, Florida always had a mystique for me something born of moss-hung trees and unknown visions only half seen in the shadows. I'm constantly yearning to rediscover this mythical Xanadu, to make a real-life connection with it any way I can. Bill loads up a houseboat with kayaks, scuba gear, and enough rations for two weeks and sets out to retrace Billy Bartram's path along the St. John's. He begins his search at Picolata, just below Green Cove Springs, some 55 miles south of the river's mouth near Jacksonville. It's a place where the rise and fall of distant ocean tides still reach, creating a diverse mix of fresh and saltwater environments. Billy stopped at Picolata twice as he explored the river sleeping in an old coquina block fort. This fortress is very ancient and was built by the Spanish. It's a square tower, 30 feet high, invested with a high wall without bastions, about breast high, pierced with loopholes and surrounded with a deep ditch. Today, the fort has vanished without a trace. Archaeologists like Dr. Robin Denson speculate the original fort may now be underwater a victim of the ever-shifting river. 
Denson, who studies how cultures are influenced by the changes in river flow, says the St. John's has historically played a vital role in exploring and settling Florida. Within the context of a floodplain, rivers are really moving. They are, and they're moving in our lifetime, but we don't, we tend to think of the water as being where it is today. You look out your door, you see it, it's there. The St. John's would have been, you know, the first highway here in Florida for the, for the true pioneers of Florida, which were, of course, the Paleo Indians who were here, you know, 10, again, 12,000 years ago. The rivers were first and foremost important as, as transportation and routes. And it was along the course of waterways that uh, populations grew up and settlements occurred. Bill moves upstream on the St. John's, stopping at little creeks like Decoy to look more closely for the same nuances Billy Bartram once found so long ago. They are asserted to be dangerously venomous, their bite incurable, but I'm inclined to pronounce them an innocent creature with respect to mankind. Another grapevine, muscadine grapevine. Is the kind that Tarzan used to swing on. This is basically a hardwood swamp around us, sweet gum and cypress. Wonderful habitat for critters. People too, actually. In honor of Bartram's gentle intentions, the Indians affectionately called the botanist Puck Puggy, the flower hunter. Back on the St. John's, Bill approaches the old river town of Palatka, where his predecessor found a thriving Indian village in the late 1700s. Although the riverfront has changed drastically since those days, Bill thinks he may yet find some of the Bartram spirit around. And when Clay Henderson approaches in his small skiff, Bill's sure of it. You know, even with binoculars and telephone in a 13-foot boat, you get an idea what Billy Bartram was going through. <laughs> I felt pretty alone out here. Henderson, a sixth-generation Florida native, is an attorney who heads up the Florida Audubon Society, helping lead the battle to preserve again, the best the of what's left of the wild Florida. So, you know, technically you're still on the uh, Audubon part of the trip. You know, Audubon came this far, turned around and went back and said that Bartram was crazy. Did he really? Yeah. Audubon making this far? He made it. He, he came in this far. As there's entry in his diary that says, well, Bartram is a poet. He's to be forgiven. <laughs> Clay's also a lifelong Bartram aficionado and an avid fly fisherman. Bill and Clay head ashore to historic Wilson Cove to fly fish. Not unlike the way Bartram fished for the great trout along the river over two centuries ago, using a light bob with hook and feathers. Well, you know, we forget this was Florida's first tourist attraction here. Uh, you know, people would uh, come down by the tens of thousands to get back the trains for the river boats and come up here to Palatka and up to Oklahoma and down as far as Enterprise and Sanford. And I bet you that every one of those boats had a copy of Bartram on it. Like Billy Bartram, who preceded him on the river, John James Audubon also expressed his own sense of artistic wonder with the strange new subtropical world. But he carried away from here some images of uh, alligators and gallinules and coots that uh, have been a great contribution to American art, but also this you know, something that Bartram discovered, this, this concept of linking art, you know, to an, to an awareness of the environment. I don't think either one of them knew that's what they had planned on doing that when they got started. They just liked to draw. But what they did is they captured something with their drawing, and Bartram with his drawing and his writing. And uh, that's the beginnings of, you know, what we know as the environmental ethic in this country now. It's, it's an American tradition. We're blessed in Florida to have the largest land acquisition program for conservation in the whole world. When we were putting this stuff together, we had to have a plan. And one of the first starting points was Bartram's travels. Uh, he chronicled uh, his, his trip. He recorded in great detail uh, the uh, Indian settlements along the way, the Indian mounds. 
He recorded in great detail the flora and fauna that he saw, and, uh, and that's what makes it special. It gives it not only an environmental context, but a historical context to put the acquisition in. Fishing for me is not about catching fish. It's about a connectiveness to the water and the, the environment and being able to, to see how it all works together. You can immerse yourself in it. I mean, when you're, when you're working at attracting fish, you, uh, you place yourself in the environment. You see what the fish are feeding on. You see how the birds are, uh, uh, are working on the, the fish. The good news is we're not having to do this for dinner. Bear grease, you know, we just don't have enough bear grease these <laughs> days. Hard to find that down at the 7-Eleven. Bill continues his trek, passing between an island and the riverbank at Stokes Landing, where Billy Bartram once found a busy trading post called Spalding's Lower Store. There is, inhabiting the low shores and swamps of this river and the lakes of Florida, a very curious bird called by an Indian name, Efuskia, which signifies in our language the crying bird. I cannot decide what genus of European birds to join it with. South of Wallaka, where the river dilates into a small bay known as Little Lake George, Bill finally has a chance to visit a place few have ever seen. Along with cave diver Eric Hutchison from nearby Ocala, Bill will search for Croker Hole, a powerful freshwater spring at the bottom of the river. Eric, who has traveled worldwide to explore and map underwater caves, will survey the artesian spring for the very first time. It isn't hard to find. It's a favorite spot for local anglers who fish for the large striped bass schooling near the opening to the cave on the river bottom. The spring is under a thick layer of tannic, tea-colored river water, 50 feet down. It feels like we're descending through the living veins of the river itself. Although it's as black as night on the bottom, the spring water down here makes the visibility as clear as a swimming pool. Eric and I use our lights to push back into the cave, fighting a powerful spring outflow that surges against us at a velocity of 100 cubic feet per second. Eric takes notes for a map he'll draw of Croker Hole later. In doing so, he'll transport his rare vision of this hidden, seldom seen Florida back to the rest of the world, much like Billy Bartram did with his own drawings. Great, Dad. We're producing documents of a part of the Earth that nobody has ever seen, and just like uh, Mr. Bartram's drawings in his books and things that are, that are published, they're, they're actually historical documents of what once was. And I know one day when we're all dead and gone or whatever, that that's what my drawings and maps will stand for as well. This is like the first draft of history, right? Yeah, this would be a, a first draft profile of Crocoholt. And off to this side was that little teeny bottleneck that you stuck your head in that had that fierce, fierce oh. flow. Another thing that really drives me with this is that being a Floridian and growing up in Florida all my life, um, in Miami and in the tourist areas, uh, most people, the general knowledge of Florida is that uh, every, it's, it's completely developed. And here on any given day, we can go where nobody has ever been, right here in Florida, right beneath our doorstep. Mm -hmm. Right down into the vast fountain of ether. There you go, the sunless sea. Like his other maps of underground rivers, it may one day help hydrologists and even land planners better understand the mystique of this fragile resource. Leaving the narrow winding channel of the St. John's, Bill heads out beyond Drayton Island into Bartram's Little Sea, the massive Lake George. The lake is a 12 by 5 mile wide inland lagoon where a strong wind can quickly turn calm, flat waters into rolling, dangerous breakers. By late afternoon, the wind settles, and Bill anchors on the western rim of Lake George, near the mouth of Salt Springs. He locates it just as Billy once had, by watching carefully for where the clear spring run meets the darker river water. 
Here, Bill spends a peaceful night on the river. By morning, Bill and Eric prepare to dive into Salt Springs to more deeply plumb the experience Billy Bartram first had during his visit here in 1774. To reach the cave system, they follow the winding six-mile-long spring run to the natural basin where Billy once camped following a crystal clear creek bristling with wildlife. Like other Florida springs, salt gushes out of the aquifer from the limestone just under the earth's crust. Replenished by rainfall that percolates down into the sandy uplands, the springs emerge from the rock clear and eternally cool, nurturing a rich subtropical environment of plants and animals on land and underwater. I entered this pellucid stream, sailing over the heads of innumerable squadrons of fish, which, although many feet deep in the water, were distinctly to be seen floating like butterflies in the cerulean ether. The divers carry their gear into the spring basin, sinking finally down into this vast fountain of ether, 220 years after it was first described, descending as if in a dream. Underwater, the divers soon find the rocky crevices venting spring water here are dangerous chimney-like tunnels, too narrow for deeper exploration. Sometimes, even dreams are best left unresolved. Heading southward, Bill charts a course for Silver Glen Springs. Bartram camped here alone near the spring mouth in a little lagoon with a clean sandy beach at the edge of a thick forest. Billy's experience at Silver Glen seemed a model in natural serenity, a prelude for the transcendentalism of Thoreau and Emerson. Today, Silver Glen is one of the heaviest used sites in the Ocala National Forest. Boaters and visitors flock to the historic spring for many reasons, but few of them have anything to do with natural serenity. At least one person, though, still takes a keen interest in examining the past here, searching for threads that bind it with the present. For Dr. Ray Willis of the U.S. Forest Service, Billy Bartram's visit to the area was a tiny notch in time, one that stretches back 8,000 years and more to when pre-Columbian Indians lived, fished, and hunted here. The original descriptions of this man uh, were made by uh, Jeffries Wyman, in 1860 uh, when he was coming down the or up the St. John's documenting uh, all the uh, shell mounds that he shell heaps the found and uh, I believe there's around 20 21 that he uh, located and mapped and of these he noted the ones at uh, Silver Glen Springs were the largest that he found he said at that time they formed a, a natural amphitheater around the spring itself but a large chunk of the mound was removed earlier in the century by drag lines, which carried the shell away for road fill. This tree is a good indicator of at least the minimum height of uh, the shell. Been, if anything, these springs, uh, especially Silver Glen, can be seen as a, a human watering hole. I mean, as long as there have been humans in this area, they've come to Silver Glen Springs, and they're still coming today. In preparation for an exploratory dive into the cave here, Eric shows Bill a map he's already made from the earlier work at Silver Glen. Anchored at the edge of Silver Glen Springs, the divers once more prepare to plumb the mythological depths of another real-life counterpart to the romantic vision of Xanadu. Deep inside the cave, Eric uncovers remnants of prehistoric animals that once lived around the springs, the bone fragment of a mastodon, the claw of a giant sloth. Once flesh and blood, the animals are now extinct, fossilized shards that evoke a nearly forgotten era along the St. John's.
cool cave, huh? Oh, man, beautiful. Bill soon arrives at Idlewild Point, next to Lake Dexter, a place where Bartram was repeatedly attacked by voracious alligators. Here he puts ashore with his tent stowed in his kayak, dragging a largemouth bass he intends to cook over a fire for dinner. The alligators began to roar and appear in uncommon numbers along the shore. My situation now became precarious. Two very large ones attacked me closely at the same instant, and I expected any moment to be dragged out of the boat and instantly devoured. Billy used a sail for his tent when he needed one. And otherwise, he slept under large oak trees on top of mounds of Spanish moss. There are some big gators around here we've seen in the water today. So we're going to throw our fish heads as far away from the campsite as we can. As much as I like Billy Bartram, I don't want to go through an alligator battle like he did. People have been cooking largemouth bass on this mound for thousands of years and eating snail shells and anything else that didn't move as fast as they did. Underway again, Bill nears Lake Beersford, where Bartram was driven ashore during a violent thunderstorm. Here he took refuge at a large manor house that was the center of a thriving indigo plantation. Biologist Fred Harden, another Bartram affectionado who lives not far away on the banks of the Wakaiva River, joins Bill here. Together they look for signs of the past, examining how nature has consumed the once grand Beersford plantation. Looks like a, a brick from the, from the foundation of what might be the Beresford yeah. plantation, huh? The place that he thought this was probably handmade, probably was. Billy Bartram didn't really fit in with his time, did he? He'd be the hippie of, of this time, because he, he couldn't make a living at doing anything except art and, and go on expeditions and collecting plants. He was the first native-born naturalist in, of this country, and, you know, and he, he dealt with, at least in writing, with Linnaeus, who came up with the scientific genus and species system we use today, you know, so he was there on the forefront of, of things. Uh, here we go. You remember when he wrote up how it was a brilliant yellow, orange, red, multicolor mm -hmm. flower? That is. Oh, that's a beautiful antenna. And he, what was it, up on Drayton Island, which was just, what, mm -hmm. north of here, 20 right. miles, something like yeah. that? So that's probably the same kind of plant he saw. When I was born in Florida, like one and a quarter million, now there's almost 15 million people, so it's exploding, and, and these kind of things are going to get, going to disappear. At nearby Hontoon Island, where archaeologists once found a 600-year-old wooden owl from a Timaquan village preserved in the river mud, Bill meets Bill Dreggers, a folk historian who specializes in the steamboat era of the St. John's. Gregor seems as if he may have just strolled out of the past, fully intact. In 1870s and 18, early 1880s was the heyday of the steamboats on the St. John's River. They said there were so many boats that you could look for or aft off of a steamboat and see another boat at any time of the day or night. There was that many of them. A lot of the boats burned because of the, they had no regulations on the valves of the steam boilers in there, and that the, the fireman would get stoked up on moonshine and whiskey, and then he'd stoke that boiler up too high with fat lighted pine, and he'd blow that sucker sky high. By the 19th century, Billy Bartram's genuine fascination with the St. John's in Florida had been displaced by the precursor to modern public relations spin. Now, if you'd read the old ads in the 1870s, if you could ever get to Florida, you'd live forever. There wasn't any fevers or nothing, and it was just a wonderful place, and a lot of the ads showed huge hotels on the river, never built. Finally, Bill reaches Blue Springs. Although Billy found his way farther south to Puzzle Lake during an earlier trip with his father, John, he ended his solitary journey in 1774 at Blue Springs. 
Here he found an oasis of plants and animals thriving around the basin of another vast fountain and along its meandering spring run. This creek, which is formed by this admirable fountain, is wide and deep enough for a sloop to sail up into the basin. The water is perfectly diaphanous with clear cerulean waters with alligators and gar numerous in the basin. Blue Springs is the last chance Bill has to follow the pathway that Bartram first charted to launch one final allegorical search for the mystical Xanadu. Underwater, the cavern of blue plunges down into the limestone, forming fissures and bedding planes, odd geological underpinnings, every bit as spectacular as any mountain range. Cautiously, Bill descends into the chasm, down to a depth of 120 feet, where Blue Springs tapers into a tight, vertical tunnel that is impossible to pass. Nearing the surface, the banks where Billy Bartram once sat to marvel at the bubbling natural fountain seem to dissolve and reform, a real-life natural vision every bit as transcendental as the spring, the cave, as the great and noble river itself. Maybe questing for the sweet mysteries Billy Bartram found along the St. John's isn't a mythic dream after all. Maybe we can find it every time we smell the perfume of the magnolia blossom, hear the cry of a limpkin in the new dawn. Each time we let the sunless sea boil up out of the rock and, for the briefest moment, touch something everlasting in our soul. And that's our program. Here's some of what you'll see next time on Florida Crossroads. One of Ocala's best kept secrets and one of its greatest resources is found just seven miles east of I-75. Join us for Arts on Tour as we visit the Appleton Museum next time on Florida Crossroads. information about Florida Crossroads, log on to our website, thefloridachannel.org.